afternoon, everyone. We've got another microphone. We're hoping this will be a bit better. So we're continuing our journey of discovery of how to give the body the right conditions for healing. And the body has been designed to heal, but it just needs the right conditions. And unfortunately, many people don't know those conditions. And I have a lot of uh, issues, problems, I could say, with the education system today. So I homeschooled my children. They're all homeschooled up in a rainforest and they were taught to think. Have you heard of the lost art of thinking? <laughs> and what amazed me... Lost art of common sense. What amazed me was they're all off now working, you know, they're all in their 30s, 40s now working, six of them. And I married Michael 26 years ago. He had two, I had six, so we have eight. Do you know what amazes me? When, when the issues first arose in early 2020, and many people were deceived by thinking there was a pandemic about to happen, they saw it through, they saw through it like glass. And I thought, isn't this interesting? They haven't been brought up in the mould of a, of a certain way to think and also um, to believe everything that you're told. You know, don't believe everything you don't. Don't even believe everything I tell you. Test it. Prove it. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.21, prove all things. Good advice. In fact, whatever you hear, Whatever you read, um, prove it, prove it. The Bible says, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. I like it. Prove it, if it works, what do you do? Hold fast, hold on to it. It's old English for hold on to it and keep doing it. One of the ways that the body heals is the liver. And our liver lives under our right rib and our liver is a recoverable organ and I'm so glad it's a recoverable organ because the liver is the project manager of the body so it's orchestrating the job site so to speak so our liver is a recoverable organ I'm thinking of just making this go back a little bit it's a recoverable organ which means that if it's not working well and you give it the right conditions, it can revive, it can recover. That's why you can have a liver transplant of just a part of liver, because the liver can revive, the liver can restore. So the liver's a recoverable organ. It's the largest internal organ in the body. And again, the only organ that has the ability to revive. So what I want to show you today is I want to show you what the liver does. I want to show you what the liver does with what comes into it because everything that goes, comes into the body, it goes to the blood. The blood, remember we called it the river of life. The Bible calls it the life of the flesh because it's the carrier of the blood, of the nutrients, of the oxygen to the cell and then the carrier away of waste. And the blood also carries our white blood cells. If there's one thing that everyone agreed on in 2020-2021, it is that the best defence is a strong immune system. Isn't that true? And there's one thing that will slaughter your immune system. It's called the clot shot. <laughs> Doesn't make much sense, does it? So a strong immune system. And a strong immune system, of course, means that it can fight disease and it can basically keep your body working well. And probably one of the main parts of our immune system are our white blood cells. And the blood not only carries red blood cells, which are the carrier of the nutrients and the carrier away of the waste, but blood also carries white blood cells. And our white blood cells, believe it or not, they are established by our gut flora. And now, so that we're getting back again to gut flora. And tonight, when we go on our journey through our gastrointestinal tract, and tonight when we go on our 
journey through our gastrointestinal tract. We'll be looking at the different parts of the colon and we'll be ending up looking at our gut flora. And also tonight, we'll be able to give you a little bit more of an idea of some of the topics that we're going to be looking at this week. So if all environmental poisons, when they come into the body, they go straight to the liver, again, the project manager. And sometimes the liver looks at it and says, this is a nasty guy. We're going to wrap it up in fat and store it. And this explains why when a uh, Vietnam veteran attended our program because I speak about the Vietnam War because I think it was the first main war where a lot of chemical, a lot of chemical warfare was used. And a lot of those veterans have a lot of chemical poisons in their body. And he said to me, my doctor told me not to lose weight. Now, why did the doctor tell him that? Because the doctor knew that wrapped up in his fat cells <laughs> are some pretty nasty environmental poisons. And I'm going to show you how the body can even deal with that, specifically the liver. But before we go there, I want to look at what happens when, with the food that we're eating. Everything that goes into the body goes first to the liver. And never in the history of mankind have human beings eaten so many of this food group. It's called carbohydrates. No matter what country I go into, they have become high carbohydrate consumers. Now notice I said become, because traditionally people were not high carbohydrate consumers. And I'll show you why. So most people today have either cereal or bread for breakfast, and it doesn't take them very long. So mid-morning, they're reaching for cakes. Now I'm going to say cakes etc here because if I list all of the sweet carbohydrates we'd fill the board. So we're looking at um, cakes, cookies, biscuits, donuts, uh, croissants, muffins, uh, pasties, pies, you can even put pretzels in there. So we're just going to say cakes etc. Pasta, I didn't know what pasta was till I was about 18. I'm a fifth generation Australian Scottish descent. Every night we have uh, sausages or chops, mashed potatoes, frozen peas or beans every night of the week, except for Sunday, then mum would cook a roast lamb. Uh, Scottish descent, that's what, that's what they eat. I married an Irishman and that's the way he grew up. <laughs> pasta wasn't part of the equation. But I don't think there's a home today that doesn't have pasta in the home. And pizza, this is the other carbohydrate that uh, the Europeans introduced us to, Australians and Americans. Rice, we never had rice as a child. I think some of my aunties that liked cooking would do a, a, a rice pudding, I think, where the rice is cooked with milk and sugar in the, baked in the oven. That was a very traditional one. But of course, uh, the Asians have introduced us to, to rice. Potatoes is something that we ate every single meal. And we eat every single meal at home because my husband, well, that's why I'm an O'Neill is Irish, love their potatoes. And then last and certainly least in nutritive value is the pure crystallised acid that's been extracted from the sugarcane plant. Now, I, I raised my children in a rainforest. This was not fast food. It takes a while to make cereal, it takes a while to make bread, it takes a while to make the cakes, etc., etc. Oh, make pasta from scratch, takes a while. Pizza takes a while. Rice, you've got to cook. Potatoes, you've got to cook. Well, sugar. I think the only sugar you can get around here is maple syrup, is that right? <coughs> that's, a little, that's my favourite sweetener. So, but home on the farm, that is not fast food, is it? And yet in the city, isn't that your fast food? In fact, they are bound. The supermarket, there's a whole aisle to cereal, a whole aisle to bread, cake shops abound. Pizza, pastas, I think there's a whole aisle to all the different types of pastas, rice. You call them French fries, you know, every takeaway shop has them. 
I don't think anyone chose to become a high carbohydrate consumer, it's just convenience. One lady said, Barbara, you don't understand, I don't cook. <laughs> I feel like saying, well, do you eat? <laughs> if people say, Barbara, you're such a good cook, I said, yeah, that's because I like eating. <laughs> I like food to taste fantastic. But it's something that has just happened because of our fast society reaching for the quicks. They're the quick fixes. But I'd like to show you what happens in the, in the body. All of these foods break down to glucose. And glucose is the main fuel used by every cell in the body. And let's have a look at what happens in the cell. The glucose goes into the cell and it goes through a 20-step pathway and this 20-step pathway gives us two units of energy. But the end result of the 20-step pathway is a chemical form of glucose called pyruvate. And pyruvate, as the chemical form of glucose, gets fed into what's often called the powerhouse of the cell. Called the powerhouse of the cell because this eight-step pathway delivers to us an impressive 36 units of energy. So the difference is oxygen. This pathway, no oxygen. This pathway is an oxygenated pathway. What a difference oxygen makes, and we'll be looking at that in other lectures. But what I wanted to show you was what the liver does with glucose. Number one, it sends it to the cell to be burnt as fuel. But on a high carbohydrate diet, we've still got lots of glucose left over, so now it's stored. And it's stored like a little bunch of grapes. And these are little molecules of glucose. They're called glycogen. Quick release glucose stores. That's why you don't have to have breakfast before your morning exercise because you've got glycogen stores in there. So when you start moving the body, it starts plucking the glycogen stores, feed it down the pathway, pluck, feed down the pathway. But we're looking, and we'll look at that in another lecture and its role in certain diseases. But we're just looking at the role of glucose today and what your liver does with it. So number one, your liver sends the glucose from the food you eat to the cell to be burnt in the energy cycles. Number two, it's stored like little bunches of grapes, but they're little molecules of glucose called glycogen. But on a high carbohydrate we've still, diet, we've still got lots of glucose left over. So where does the body send it now? The most amazing fuel depot in the human body, it stores as fat. Now I've just given you the basic science there to show you that fat doesn't make you fat. What makes you fat? <laughs> Is this high carb diet. Carbohydrates aren't bad. What a relief, we like them. They're not bad. It's only when they're overdone and refined. That's the problem. And if you, if you look at home on the farm and realise that all of these foods take a little, little while to make, what's the message? Bit less, bit less. It's like if you're home on the farm, what's the, what's the fast food? I notice you've got apple trees everywhere. Pick apple, eat. There's your fast food. So your fast food really is your fruit and vegetables. Pick, eat. No, no prep necessary. What's the message from nature? Eat lots of fruit and veggies. Food that takes a little bit longer to prepare, eat a little less. And if you're down on the farm and the only food you're eating is what you grow and all the nuts fall once a year, you're not going to eat all the nuts in three months, are you? Then you've got no nuts for the rest of the year. And if you put nuts in shells on the table, after about eight to ten nuts, people are getting sick of this because they've got to get back to work. So what's the message from nature on nuts? Bit less, bit less, bit less. They're a concentrated food. But we've lost the conception of that because most people live in the cities today. Most people are buying their food and they've lost the, the uh, message from nature, which is eat less of the carbohydrates. So what's the result of this high carbohydrate diet? Well, what's happening to many Americans and Australians? They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's another problem and that is 
Most of the food is eaten at the end of the day. That defies reason, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like going on a journey and to put a little bit of fuel in your car and then half an hour later another bit of fuel in your car and then another half an hour another little bit of fuel in your car. What a painful journey. And then you get to the end of your journey and fill the tank. How much sense does that make? And, and park in the garage. Isn't that what most people are doing? <laughs> little bit, little bit, little bit. By the end of the day, appetite's huge. Eat a huge meal and you just park in the garage, go to bed. And, the bo and you know what the liver says? Oh no, we're going to have to store it, store it, store it, because you're not going to use much while you're sleeping. And that's something that's really just happened, because... We're such a fast society and there, there's a problem in homes. They're called these square and rectangular boxes that are, keep, that are robbing people of their sleep. So they go to bed too late, so they get up too late. No time for breakfast. I'll just grab something on the road. Busy, busy all day. No time for this. We'll just grab this. And then the end of the day, the, the people are so hungry and... That food that they eat and eat too much of, you know, the best way to prevent an even is to lose weight is to prevent an evening appetite. The best way to lose weight is actually prevent hunger. How do you prevent hunger? You eat on time at the same time every day. You eat breakfast like a king. What's the old saying? Lunch like a queen, tea like a pauper, or you say supper. <laughs> One lady said to me, "What do paupers eat?" I said, "Sometimes nothing." <laughs> You don't need much because all you're gonna, you're just about to park in the garage. You're just about to just go to sleep. And that's, that's causing a lot of problems. And so a lot of people come to health retreats. And we have a health retreat in Australia and there, there are a few in the US too. And one of the, well you get people come for all sorts of different things but a common thing is they want to lose weight. So the first two days they just have juices. And what we do is we serve fresh fruit and vegetable juices. And we serve it at 8, at 10, at 12, at 2, and at 4 p.m. And then at 6 p.m. we serve broth, which is like a thin soup. So what's the main juice that we serve? It's 80% carrot. 80% carrot juice, 10% celery and 10% apples, called the vegetarian's milk. You could just about subsist on this. And I met a mother who, whose baby had a severe skin problem, and that's the only, only milk that that baby could have. The baby couldn't have any types of milk. And a naturopath put her baby on that juice. Baby prospered very well. It's called the vegetarian's milk. Some juices, we add a bit, bit of beet, you call it beet or beetroot. Sometimes we add a little, some greens. So that's our, our basic theme of juice. And I say to our guests, you couldn't eat in a day what we put in your juices. So you, you have high nourishment. And I want to show you why this is important for the liver. So every second juice, say the eight and the 12, and the four, we serve a green barley supplement. And this morning we had a look at how alkalizing the green barley is. See, all through the body should be alkaline except for the stomach. And as you'll see tonight, when we go on our journey through the gut, it's very important that the stomach be acid because that's what breaks our protein down. All else should be alkaline, but body's waste is acid. And so this very alkalizing juice helps, but we also give green barley every second juice. Green barley, green barley. And you'll, you'll understand why as I go through the liver and how it detoxifies. The 10 and the two o'clock juice, we serve a protein, we call it protein powder. So we serve a protein drink, and this could be hemp protein, could be pea protein, maybe organic soy protein. We add it with a little uh, almond or soy milk and a little bit of coconut milk. As I go through the liver's detoxification, you'll understand why that's important. So that's what our guests do on Monday, Tuesday. 
And there is a reason for this. See, all through our life, environmental poisons come into our body. And many times the liver stores it in fat. And the majority of our of poisons are in a fat soluble state. In a fat soluble state, they cannot be released out of the body. So the fat soluble toxins have to be broken down to a water soluble state. And that's what the liver can do. The information I'm about to give you has only been known since the early 2000s, but it explains so much. So when a person starts a detox program, like they do at our retreat, so they have Sunday lunch, which is their main meal, and then at night they have the broth, which is a lot of vegetables cooked in a lot of water for many hours and strained, high in minerals. And so Monday morning they start at 8 o'clock with their first juice, predominantly carrot, sorry, and apple juice, with a green barley supplement. Now that they're not eating solid food, and by the way, it takes about 1,200 calories to digest a meal. So when you're not digesting a meal, all of that energy, the body basically looks around for something to do. It's like me. If I'm at home on a holiday, I'm looking for things to do. And there's that pile of papers, you know, that piles up. Because every day I wash the dishes, sweep the floor and make the bed and wash the clothes. So there's the basic maintenances that we do at home. But you know, in holiday time, you, you might clean out the kitchen cupboards. You might clean out the garden shed. And that's what your body does when you go on a two-day detox. It's going to clean out the kitchen cupboards. It's going to clean out the garden shed. All of that energy that usually goes to digestion starts to go to uh, cleaning up. Because before rejuvenation can happen, you've got to clean the house. You would never go into an old house and paint a dirty old wall, would you? Now you've got to clean it first. It's common sense. And so what the liver does, as the house starts cleaning, it starts to deal with what's released. You see, with our guests on this program, we're not giving them enough glucose to run on. And so the fat cells start to break down. And as the fat cells break down to give the glucose that our body needs, something else is released. And that's the fat-soluble toxins. And that's why when a person goes for a detox, often their, their, um, their breath is pretty bad. <laughs> Body odour is a bit worse than usual. What they're leaving in the, in the toilet is a lot worse than usual. If people tell me, I say, rejoice, where was it before it came out? <laughs> And what the liver does is it deals with these fat-soluble toxins in three phases. And so our guests who have their last meal on Sunday lunch, by Sunday evening, supper doesn't appear, then phase one begins. But on Monday, it's, it's active big time. So phase one, the liver takes this fat-soluble toxin takes the fat-soluble toxin, and remember, it's been released as the fat cells get broken down to give the glucose we need. So the fat-soluble toxin, the liver takes it, and it breaks it down to a metabolite. So what's a metabolite? A metabolite simply means the first stage of metabolism. And this metabolite, nasty. It's a bad guy. This metabolite creates a lot of free radicals, and free radicals damage the tissues. This metabolite is sometimes a hundred times more toxic than it originally was. This metabolite is highly volatile. And you might look at this and you might say, what's the liver doing? It's created something more toxic than it originally was. Well, it can be likened again to cleaning out the kitchen cupboards or cleaning out the garden shed. 
halfway through cleaning out the kitchen cupboards or the garden shed, it looks a hundred times worse than when you started. Is that right? Yes. So this is a process. And your liver has certain needs as it goes through phase one. As it goes through phase one, it needs antioxidants. Antioxidants are free radical scavengers because they come with a lot of extra electrons. If you know the chemistry behind it, a free radical is an electron short. So what it does, it grabs an electron from the next atom and then it's lost his, so now he grabs on from the next one. So they're, they're an electron short. Antioxidants have lots of extra electrons. So that's how they can stabilize the free radicals. So what are your most potent antioxidants? Beta carotene. And beta carotene is found in your orange and all your green colored vegetables. So most, well all the drinks that we give our guests are either orange or green. When we put a lot of greens in there, it becomes a bit greener. If we put beet in there, it becomes a bit redder and you know, that can be classified as high antioxidant. The green barley is very high in beta carotenes. So you can see by what our guests have that we supply high amounts, generous amounts of beta carotenes. Another antioxidant, probably the most famous, is vitamin C. Vitamin C is not ascorbic acid. In his book, The Calcium Lie, I mentioned his book this morning, Dr. Robert Thompson, he says to take antioxidant, to take ascorbic acid for vitamin C is like receiving an envelope in the mail with nothing in it. Useless. <laughs> so how do we get our vitamin C? You can buy vitamin C and you can buy ascorbic acid as long as it has bioflavonoids in it. And that's how it's found in nature. Ascorbic acid has lots of bioflavonoids in it. That's how you'll find it in the orange, in the kiwi fruit. Actually, they did tests on all the supermarket fruit and vegetables, and they found the highest was cabbage, the highest in vitamin C. <laughs> you see, the majority of oranges, they're not organic, they're picked green, you know, and they're sprayed, so this is the nutrient value is getting less and less and less. That's why if you see an old farmhouse and the oranges are falling off the tree, find out who owns it and say, would you like me to clean up your lawn? <laughs> my, my son was a landscaper in uh, quite a, a rich suburb in Melbourne for his first few years of landscaping. And he came and he used to landscape the gardens. He was under an apprenticeship. And a lady came out one day and said, William, take all those orange things off the lawn. <laughs> they were oranges. <laughs> Messy. <laughs> he said, Mum, I'm eating them every day, these wonderful oranges. I wonder if that lady buys orange juice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the work of picking, cutting, the waste, I guess. But, oh, the nutrient value of those oranges, very high. The other antioxidant is vitamin E. And vitamin E is one of your fat soluble vitamins. So looking across at the program that we do at our retreat, the protein powder with its little bit of coconut cream and, and almond, that has vitamin E in it. So you can see we are nutritionally supporting the liver because remember what its aim is, is to bring the fat soluble toxin down to a water soluble state. Within 36 hours of beginning a de detox program. So looking at our detox program when the guest's final meal is Sunday lunch, so Monday, uh, phase one is happening big time and we're supporting the liver well with the green barleys and the juices. But Tuesday morning, we're definitely coming into phase two. So what happens in phase two of the liver detox? In phase two of the liver detox, the liver takes this highly toxic metabolite and it joins it together with amino acids. The union of this highly toxic metabolite and the amino acids produces the water-soluble state. 
and as a water-soluble state, it can be easily released out of the body. So in phase two, the liver takes this highly toxic metabolite and it joins it together with amino acids. And the union of amino acids and the toxic metabolite creates the water-soluble state. And isn't that what we've all been waiting for? And this explains why we serve a protein drink every second juice, but not on Monday, uh, on Monday, but on Tuesday, when the guests have now gone into second stage, we do one, two, three protein drinks and only two pr green barleys, because on Tuesday, their liver's requirements for amino acids are much higher. The more fat-soluble toxins released, the more metabolites, the more amino acids are needed. How many people go on a juice fast or a water fast and take protein drinks? It's rare, isn't it? It, it rarely happens. No wonder many people go on a fast and get sick. Because if they don't take the protein drink, too much metabolites are created and that can make the person very sick. One lady told me she went on a 10-day water fast and by the third day she was just vomiting, diary, vomiting, diarrhea. And the doctor who was presiding over this, juice, this water fast said, are oh, you going through a healing crisis? It was a liver crisis. Since I learned about this, which was probably 15 years ago, since I learned about this, we serve the protein drinks every, every program. And since we've been doing that, we hardly have anyone that has adverse effects going through the juice fast. And we had one young guest about 16 years ago who put my attention to this. His name was Anton, he was 44, fairly fit, but a lot of, quite a few allergies. It was Tuesday, the second day of the fast. And he said, I need to speak to Barbara. So I came and said, what is it, Anton? He said, I need protein. He said, I just feel terrible. It's, my body seems to be crying out for protein. And you know what every health professional should do to you? I'm hearing you. So I didn't, know, I didn't know why, but I made him up a protein drink. I gave it to him. I saw him half an hour later. He said, that's better. But this brought me to the drawing board. It brought me back to the drawing board. I wanted to know why. Why did Anton need protein? He just felt that's what he needed. And I gave it to him, and we got results. And it was about that time we had a businessman do our program. And he was in his 60s. He said, you're not going to like this, Barbara, but I go really well on the Atkins diet. He said, when I go off the Atkins diet, he said, I go down. You know what I wanted to know? Why? 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 And you know that the, the, the answer to both those questions is found in the liver detox. Because what's the Atkins diet? Uh, all you ever hear about, all I ever heard about was meat, butter, cream, cheese, eggs, meat, butter, cream, cheese, eggs, meat, butter, cream, cheese, eggs. So I thought, hmm, I might read that book. I was not interested in reading the Atkins book because I eat plants. And this guy, apparently, it's all you hear about is meat, butter, cream, cheese, eggs. Anyway, God had a way. Do you notice that? God has a way of teaching you. I was staying in a friend's place about a month after this and I was in the spare room and I woke up the next morning and my eyes went on the bookcase. Oh, I'm a reader. I love reading. If I've got a bit of extra time in the airport, I'm in the bookshop. So I'm looking at the books and then my eyes stopped at one book. Dr. Atkins' New Revolutionary Diet. Hmm. Okay. I'll read it. I could not put it down. It was such a fascinating book. Such a fascinating book because he shows that the three essential food groups, here are the three essential. What does essential mean? We cannot make it, we've got to put it in. Fibre. 
Fibre is necessary to sweep the gastrointestinal tract every day, as you'll see tonight. The next essential food group is protein. You cannot heal without protein. You cannot build without protein. Your DNA, the crosswood bands, is made up of amino acids. Protein. 50% of the membrane around every cell is protein. It's an essential nutrient. The third is fat. Whoa. Did you know that fat causing heart disease is a myth? It's a total myth. We've been deceived. This morning we talked about the, <laughs> the deception. I've got a book at home called The Great Cholesterol Con by Dr. Malcolm Kendrick. And he says, I'm still waiting for the proof that fat and cholesterol cause heart disease. Eee. Tomorrow, we're going to look at heart disease. Tomorrow at 3 o'clock, we're going to look at heart disease. And I'm going to show you the truth on heart disease. How do I know it's the truth? I've proved it. And you know, the proverb says, in a multitude of counsellors, there's safety. It's not the fat. And not even fat makes you fat. What makes you fat? It's this high carbohydrate diet. Carbohydrates aren't bad. My husband would never forgive me if the potatoes stopped. The Chinese would never forgive me if the rice stopped. <laughs> no, carbohydrates aren't bad. It's only when they're overdone and refined. And isn't that what most people are doing? It's when it's overdone and refined. So Dr. Robert Atkins, I read his book and I was quite amazed at his book. Do you know that you had to eat three cups of vegetables a day on the Atkins diet and one cup had to be greens? No wonder he got away with it. <laughs> because meat, butter, cream, cheese, eggs has no fibre, has no minerals. We need a balance. We need a balance. And by the way, his patients on his diet, their cholesterol levels were coming down. Did everyone hear that? Meat, butter, cream, cheese, eggs, and the cholesterol levels coming down? Atkins scratched his head. He didn't do it for that. He did it for weight loss. Yes, the weight came off, because when you don't give the body these carbohydrates, and you're giving high amounts of fiber, protein, and fat, your liver can convert protein to glucose, your liver can convert fat to glucose, and your liver breaks down your fat stores to, to give glucose. It's called gluconeogenesis, giving the body glucose from the stored fat. His book was number one on the New York Times best-selling list four years running. And when I talked to a doctor, Dr. Carl Benjamin, he said to me, I used to be one of Atkins' patients. He said, nice guy. He said, I believe if Dr. Atkins had read the China study, he would have become a vegetarian. Can you do it on a plant-based diet? You can. Well, we know the fibre, what your fruit and vegetables. Protein, legumes, the forgotten legumes. Nuts and seeds, fats, nuts and seeds. People have been eating coconut oil and olive oil for centuries. And it never caused heart disease back then. No, there's something else that's come into the equation. It's called the altered fats, the refined oils, the peanut oil, the corn oils, you know, the sunflower oils in glass bottles. So it's not the fat. Well, there is a fat that's, that's harmful and that's your altered fats and your heated fats. The fat that can handle heat is coconut because it's a saturated fat, it's a great fat. And what you'll notice on the Atkins diet, they were getting the fibre, which is the beta carotenes, they were getting the protein, and they were getting the fats, which means his diet, I, th I don't think they discovered the three phase of the liver detox till after Atkins' death but it showed one of the reasons why the people went well on it. But this Carl Benjamin, he came to see me because he said, I don't want to stay on this diet any longer. I'm getting arthritis because the meat was causing acid. He said, you're the first nutritionist I've met that hasn't slammed Atkins. 
I used to give a meeting in the 90s called Dr. Atkins Missing Link and it was the plant-based proteins. But can you see on the high carbohydrate diet, people are overdoing the non-essential and by the way, the non-essential is the carbohydrates. And they were underdoing or missing out on the, on the three essentials. What does phase two need? Phase two needs protein. Protein's an essential nutrient. 50% of the membrane around every cell in the body is protein. If a young man comes to me and says, Barbara, I've gone on a plant-based diet. I see the dangers of the meat, especially the meats in the supermarkets today. But I've lost weight. I've lost energy. I've lost muscle. I know straight away what happened. He stopped the meat and he went straight to the carbs. <laughs> Stop the meat and instead of the meat, pasta. Yeah, breads, cereals. I said, I know exactly what's happened. <laughs> You're protein deficient. So my son James, built with a body like me, very hard to put on weight. How did he do it? Because he's big now. Very muscly. Worked out big time, but protein. He had to supplement with protein. He had to make sure protein because the new cells are built on protein. But there's a big difference between animal protein and plant protein. Animal protein, you've got about 58% that gets burnt as fuel. That's 42% waste. And it's an acid waste that requires calcium to calm it down, another leacher of calcium. Whereas not so plant. Plant proteins are much cleaner burning fuel because they have a more alkaline effect than acid effect. And we'll look at that in another lecture when we look at acid alkaline. Back to the three phase of the liver detox. So phase one of the liver detox, the liver takes the fat soluble toxin that's released from the fat cells because the person's on a fast and the fat cells are being released to supply the glucose that's needed. And the Vietnam veteran that came to our program, and remember his doctor said, don't lose weight, but he wanted to do the fast. He actually wanted to detox and cleanse his body. So I gave him the protein supplement every single juice. <laughs> And I gave him another one at 7.30 at night because I knew that a lot of nasty things were coming out of him. And as the first phase break them down to a metabolite, well, we want to quickly mop it up with the amino acids. Phase two happens in conjunction with phase three. So in phase three, the liver takes this water-soluble state and release it, releases it out via our sweat glands, releases it out via our urine, releases it out via our colon. They're our organs of elimination. So phase three is happening in conjunction with phase two. So this is how the liver detoxify us from environmental poisons. Aren't you glad that it can do that? Because it's inevitable that we are exposed. Even if we get every chemical out of our house, out of our food, we are not 100% organic at our retreat. We do the best we can, but it's not easy. It's not easy. You do the best you can. Grow as much as you can, but even when you grow, you've got to go for your non-hybrid, your non-GMO seeds. Our garden at Misty Mountain is non-GMO. In 2020, I became the gardener at Misty Mountain. And I remember I went away for a while, and when I came back, I looked at where I'd weeded last, and it was a purple bed, just the, you know, from one side to the other of this room. And our garden's twice as long as that at our retreat. What was the purple? 
It was like a carpet of purple. Oh, they were the little um, kale seeds because the kale had gone to seed months before and thrown its seed. So my weeds are almost vegetables <laughs> because all the food that we grow is non-hybrid, non-GMO. So when it goes to seed, I'm always, and we just had to dig it into the ground. That sounds so sad. We kept a bit. <laughs> but that's what your non-hybrid seeds will do. They just keep reproducing. One of the best ways to start with a garden is just greens, parsley, rocket, kale, all your dark greens. They're incredibly high in minerals. Remember, that's what glues us together. And those greens are highly alkalizing like we use in our green barley. Try and have it every meal. And when you cook your greens, you do not lose your minerals. That's good to know, isn't it? I've got a friend who grew up in, um, in Italy. He said, we didn't have all these, these dried herbs in Italy. He said, my mum used to put cupfuls of finely cut parsley in every stew. There are high minerals in that. And the celery that we grow in our garden, it looks a bit like um, Italian parsley. It's sort of stringy and sticky. I don't know what they do to that celery to make it those big fat stalks. But most of the flavour for the celery in the soup or the stew comes from the leaves. So we use, and there, there's more dark greens, dark greens. Put it in, put it in everything. <laughs> your dark green. Put it in your guacamole, put it in your mashed potatoes. Greens, try and have them every single meal. And remember, when you cook them, you don't lose your minerals. And that's the old fashioned stock. And that's really what our broth at night is. We put all sorts of things in there, especially if we're cooking. <laughs> yes, you can, yes, you No, you don't, no, you don't, you don't. I gave this lecture a few years ago to a conference and a man came up and he said, this is not for your lay people, this is for your academics. I said, lay people have livers too. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important information, isn't it? Because we're dealing with more fat soluble toxins than any generation that ever lived on the planet. And they're coming in so many different ways. Do you know that electricity you find in those chemical fabrics, it attracts more chemicals? I'm sure if you had time between the last lecture and this one, you were in your laundry cupboard, is that right? <laughs> Looking at what your cleaning products are. There are so many areas that we get exposed to plastics. We get exposed to chemicals. And the chemicals in a lot of plastics today, notice that the plastic bottles, you can squeeze them now. That's because they have non phenols in them. They're estrogen mimickers, so it's affecting the hormones. And my first lecture tomorrow morning will be on hormones. And men and women all have the same hormones, just in different amounts. Men have more testosterone, women have more estrogen, but it's the same hormones in both. And that can sometimes be the missing link I mean, some diseases is a hormonal imbalance. And there are many things, as you will see, that we are exposed to today that are causing the imbalance. When I came this morning with Christina in a car and her little, her little baby, I noticed the little baby had a little giraffe. And I know that giraffe because my daughter ordered one for her baby. It's made out of rubber. How many babies are sucking on plastics? Eat. They're a bit more expensive, but she said, oh, I inherited that one. And of course, that's the beauty of buying wooden toys and wooden rattles and, and rubber is that you can, you know, you'll, it'll even do your grandchildren <laughs> once it's done all your children. These are all these hidden ways where we're exposed to environmental poisons. And so ideally, you reduce the exposure to the environmental poisons as much as possible. And at the same time, give the body the nutrients that it needs to be able to detoxify us. The most popular way of eating today is called time-restricted eating. And this basically has evolved or come out of the 5-2 diet. You've heard of the 5-2 diet, intermittent fasting. 
It's, it's quite a popular way. So what's time-restricted eating? Time-restricted eating is eating twice. Twice in a six hour, with six hours apart in a 24 hour. Time-restricted eating. You know what they're finding with time-restricted eating? They're finding that um, diabetics are managing their blood sugar levels better. And what did we used to be told? What was the diabetic used to be told? Eat every two hours. And as you'll see tonight when we go on our journey through the gastrointestinal tract, the stomach requires three and a half to four hours at least to digest a meal. I said to my, well, my husband told me one day, he said, I had a four hour job to do today. It's the end of the day and it's still not even half done. Why? He kept getting interrupted. The phone would ring, someone would knock on his door. That's exactly what happens with the stomach. If you keep interrupting it, then digestion never actually gets fully completed. And that, that is a contributing factor to the bloating a lot of people experience. So the time-restricted eating is just eating twice in a 24-hour period. So let's say you, and a lot of retirees, they say they're eating at nine and three. That's a, that's a good one. Or it might, I know at our retreat, we serve breakfast at 7.30 and we serve lunch at 1.30 and then of an evening we just serve broth, which is the thin soup. So our guests are getting an 18 hour fast every 24 hours. Isn't that an easy way to do it? So when you would be most hungry, you're actually sound asleep. And isn't it interesting that, that uh, science now proves the old saying, breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, tea like a, or supper like a, like a pauper. That's the time restricted eating, supporting that, that old theory. But as I mentioned, when we first looked at this carbohydrate diet, people are picking all day long, all day long, all day long, and then big meal at the end of the day. And so there's no detoxification happening at all. So if we were to take up the time-restricted eating program, then we would be allowing our body to have an 18-hour fast every 24 hours. And so little by little, it would allow our body to bit by bit clean up those fat-soluble toxins that are in our fat cells. So if someone comes to our program who is a cleaner and has had a lot of exposure to chemicals, we put them on the protein drink every meal. If someone comes to us who's been a printer, been exposed to a lot of chemicals in the print, same thing. Builders, especially builders that are soaring through the treated woods. So do most people we find that doesn't, don't have a high chemical load in their body, we find they cope very well just with the, um, with, the, with the two protein drinks on the Monday and then the three protein drinks on the, on the Tuesday. What it's revealing today is that is the best way to fast. 100 years ago you could probably do a water fast because those people were not dealing with the fat soluble toxins stored up in the fat cells. But today we absolutely are and they're coming in so many hidden ways. What if someone does a four day or a seven day juice fast? They are far better to do two, two days a week or two days, we say a fortnight, but. I don't think you say that, two weeks, fortnight's two weeks, we're English rules, so I guess we've got English sayings, or two days a month, rather than do a whole week. Because if you do a whole week, too many fat soluble toxins are gonna to be broken down, too many metabolites are gonna be re re released, and that can make a person quite sick. And sometimes when people do a long fast, they can be sicker when they started than when they began. Because when they're in storage, that's what the body does. It says wrap it up in fat and storage. It's actually safe there, <laughs> which is it's encased. It's like the waste that they entomb and then dump into the sea. Well, they say that it's safe. One wonders. Because we are dealing with, with so many today. But if you give the liver the right conditions, 
it can effectively detoxify you. There are some herbs, and you might be surprised that the, one of the most potent liver herbs is the humble lemon. A lot of people choose to have warm lemon water early in the morning. It's a great little uh, tonic for the liver. All our salad dressings that we use at our retreat are all based on lemon, sometimes just lemon, olive oil and crushed garlic and Celtic salt. That's a nice one. Or if you want to make it creamier, we might blend up some uh, tahini. That makes it nice and creamy. But lemon, put lemon on everything. Put it on your fruit salad, put it on your salad. Also, uh, some bitter herbs. Some of your bitter herbs are milk thistle, also called St. Mary's thistle. So it's one of the best uh, liver herbs. And in Psalm 104, verse 14, the Bible says that God gave herbs for the service of man. So they're to serve you. So when the herbs come in, they say, where would you like me? Where's, where's the areas of greatest need? And what I found fascinating as I studied herbology, that every herb has a different effect on different body parts. So milk thistle is, a, is probably one of the best tonics for the liver. It can even cleanse the liver, even unblock blockages in the liver. Also dandelion. We mentioned dandelion this morning. Roasted dandelion root is a is a coffee alternative. But also, we talked about the dandelion has a plant chemical in there that inhibits the mRNA reproducing the spike protein. So that makes it even more attractive, doesn't it? And if someone has been blackmailed into taking the clot shot, and called the clot shot because that, that spike protein creates nanoparticle clots which are almost barely measurable clots, but you put a few of them together, you've, and there's, there's your clot shot. But the dandelion can inhibit the mRNA re reproducing that spike protein, so that's good news too. Also, the sweet bitter, often called the sweet bitter, is ginger. Gentian is another very bitter, bitter herb. It's a root. So this is a seed, but these are all roots. And as seeds and roots, if you make a tea out of it, they need a gentle simmer. So there are your herbs that can boost liver function. One of the liver's main roles is to produce bile, to break down your polyunsaturated fats. And there's a little reservoir at the bottom of the liver called the gallbladder. One lady said, Barbara, I don't make any bile anymore. My gallbladder's gone. I said, actually, you do, because the liver makes the bile. You can't live without a liver, <laughs> but you can live without a gallbladder. But ideally, we keep our gallbladder. It's there for a purpose. And in my book, Self Heal by Design, I have a chapter on the liver. And I also include um, a simple liver cleanse. And it's a very simple liver slash gallbladder cleanse. So if there's any sludge or stones in there, you can, you can go through the simple cleanse, which will help to, to eliminate them. You don't have to have the gallbladder taken out. It produces bile in response to fat. So when we <coughs> eat fat, even in the mouth, then the messages are given to the brain that actually speaks to the liver to get some bile ready because there are some fats coming. If someone's on a fat-free diet, well, the liver doesn't have to do much and the gallbladder can get a little bit stagnant. And that's why fat is an important part of the diet. We get our fat in our nuts, our seeds, our avocados, coconuts, olives, but the two oils that have been used for centuries and, were, and both of these oils are extracted from the flesh of the plant. That's your olive, olive oil. And make sure it's uh, first cold pressed, extra virgin. And the other one is coconut. Two oils that have been used for centuries. And in the countries where these oils have been used extensively, 
uh, no heart disease. Did you hear that? And the uh, Maasai, aren't they dying like flies of heart disease because they live on blood, milk and meat? Uh, zero heart disease. You see, these countries show it's not the fat. It's the fat's not causing heart disease. I'd like to suggest that fat's been, been criticised because of who it hangs around with. <laughs> you see, it's the liver that makes cholesterol and 80% of the cholesterol it makes, it makes from glucose. And 20% of the cholesterol that the liver makes, it makes from fat. See, it's not, the, it's not the butter on the bread, it's the bread underneath the butter. The French have been eating butter for years, very zero heart disease. Do you know when heart disease really accelerated? In the 1920s when they started to extract oils from hard seas using high heat and chemical and you've heard of Crisco? And because the television said that Crisco was really good, remember whatever the television says, think the opposite? That's when heart disease, it's these chemical fats that damage the arterial wall and the liver is the organ that makes cholesterol. So it has to make, it just makes as much cholesterol as your body requires it to make. So the more damage to the arterial wall, the more cholesterol it will make. And by the way, your cholesterol, the, the, the test that says what your cholesterol levels are, that doesn't tell you what's on the arterial wall. Have you noticed that? And did you know that 40 years ago, 300 was perfectly normal? <clears throat> Do you need to contemplate that for a minute? And the Framingham Heart Study started oh, 40 years ago to prove that cholesterol causes heart disease. Well, it's 40 years later and hasn't done that. But you know what it did prove? That people with high cholesterol levels don't get Alzheimer's. Do you need a moment's silence for that one? because the fattiest organ in the body is the brain and it loves and it needs cholesterol. But what is causing Alzheimer's is the cholesterol-lowering medication. The side effect of cholesterol-lowering medication is Alzheimer's, dementia, memory loss, muscle wasting and they've just added breast cancer because as you'll see tomorrow morning when we look at hormones, that our sex hormones are made from cholesterol. If we don't have enough cholesterol, that's going to interfere with the production of our sex hormones. Mm. If you are on cholesterol-lowering medication, I've got some good news. You can stop it immediately, but there will be a side effect. Your memory will return. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Malcolm Kendrick, in his book, The Great Cholesterol Con, he's scathing on this myth that cholesterol causes heart disease. Eesh. Sorry, we've been spun a lie, been a spun a few lies. In the book, The Great Cholesterol, no, this one's the, the um, calcium lie, Dr. Robert Thompson. He's got one chapter where he lists all the myths, the fat myth, the cholesterol myth, the salt myth, the sugar myth. It just goes on and on and on. And so what your liver also needs is, I had to explain that when I, because aren't we told that we've got to go on a fat-free diet? It's a myth. I've got a friend that works with Alzheimer's Australia. She said 1,700 new cases of Alzheimer's are being diagnosed every week in Australia. And one of the most, well, the most accurate and the best history book we've got is the Bible. And I have not read, I've read the whole Bible and nowhere have I seen talk of Alzheimer's or dementia. If anything, in the early chapters, people were living for 800 years and their mind was as sharp as when they were young. And on Saturday morning, I'm going to show you how your mind can get sharper with age. Yeah. And you know what your brain needs? Fat. <laughs> but it needs good fats. And it's a little bit hard to drink a cup of olive oil a day. And what does common sense say? We don't have to. <laughs> it's a very concentrated oil. What, 30 olives to get one teaspoon? So you don't need a lot. 
one man said. So could you eat 30 olives? And one lady said, I could. (laughs) (laughs) It's only a little bit. You don't need much, but you do need a little bit. A lady I stayed with recently, she said, this is so strange for me. You've, You've eaten more olive oil in the week at my house than I've eaten in the whole year. And she's spending a fortune on creams to try and soften her face and reduce her wrinkles. She said, Barbara, what cream do you use? I say, nothing. (laughs) But I eat fats. Isn't isn't that what God meant? Now the wrinkles will come. (laughs) And my wrinkles are certainly coming. If I look in the the mirror with my glasses on, wasn't God kind to us, you know, our our eyesight (laughs) deteriorates? I only see the grey hair and the wrinkles if I put my glasses on. (laughs) I'm not wearing glasses because I can see. I can see you all, but fine print. (laughs) And wrinkles. (laughs) Need a few glasses for that. Of course they will come, but they're coming too soon with most people. Too soon. And so the, the liver needs for us to be eating nice amounts of fat. Not much, but just a little. What I'd like to look at now is I'd like to look at the organs of elimination. Because number one, it's important to give the liver the right conditions to be able to detoxify us from environmental poisons. But there's no use sweeping the house and leaving all the, all the waste at the door. We also need to stimulate our organs of elimination And our organs of elimination have certain needs. Skin. Our skin is our largest organ of elimination. Our skin does a amazing job. It's our suit of armour, so to speak. But this suit of armour, this skin, it not only throws off waste, but it also absorbs. So be careful what touches your skin. We're dealing with enough chemicals as it is without putting it onto our body. So we have a steam sauna. It's like a little hut down by the creek at Misty Mountain Health Retreat. And one of the things that the skin needs is water. And it it needs water in and it needs water out. What do I mean by out? We should be washing our bodies at least once a day. But at Misty Mountain, we have a steam sauna by the creek. And the guests go into the steam sauna and they're in there for about 10 minutes and then they go out and dive in the mountain stream or if they can't run down to the creek, they have a cold shower and then they can go back into the steam sauna for another 10 minutes. They usually do it three times. When you give your body, particularly your skin, the right conditions, up to 70% of body's waste can come out of the skin. It's an organ of elimination. So what are the right conditions? Number one, make sure you're well hydrated when you go into the steam. And you can't hydrate your body half an hour before the steam. You have to start as soon as you wake up in the morning. The most dehydrated time of the whole day is when you wake up in the morning. So as soon as you wake up in the morning, the first thing you should do is have water. But have you noticed that the water that comes out of our body is salty. So the more you perspire, the more salt that you need. But the salt that we need is whole salt. Ideally, the Celtic salt. So we have bought a packet of Celtic salt. There it is, I'll get it. This is the hand harvested sea salt. Now, because a certain person on social media, apparently, someone puts me up there, is talking so much about this, there's a worldwide shortage. But keep trying, because this hand-harvested sea salt, and that picture on the front, it's exactly what they do. They hand-harvest it. And that hand-harvested sea salt, and you'll see it's moist, it's grey, because it's got so many minerals in it, particularly magnesium. So the Celtic salt is necessary to maintain your... Uh, electrolytes, your electrolytes really are your minerals. So we suggest a crystal of Celtic salt in the mouth. They're crystals and the crystals are the best form 
because the crystals contain elements. They contain uh, minerals in parts per million. That's barely measurable. And when you crunch it on it, they're released. They're released in your mouth. And one of them is iodine. We don't need much iodine, but when you take the crystal form, it's locked up in it. It's in parts per million. That's barely measurable. But when you're having that eight times a day, because ideally you have eight glasses of water a day, eight glasses, eight, eight ounce glasses, eight glasses of water a day, you can get it all in if you start early enough. I aim for ideally three, sometimes four, before I have breakfast. And that's not all at once. Notice how God sends the rain. Gently. <laughs> Be gentle what you put in your mouth. Don't, don't put tornadoes in. You know what a tornado is? 16 ounce all at once. <laughs> that's the tornado. You know, you put 16 ounce all in at once, very soon 16 ounce is going to want to come out. I travel a lot, I'm on the plane a lot, I just sip, sip, sip. But you'll be amazed how much water you can get into your body by having it little, 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 little all day long. And before I begin every glass, a crystal of Celtic salt. How much is that? Or about the size of a sesame seed. Just a tiny little amount. That's all you need. So the steam sauna, I believe, is a very important part of the detox. Because if you can get 70% of body's waste out via the skin, that takes a load off the rest of the body. In fact, the skin is often called the third kidney. Have you heard that? Because when the kidneys aren't doing well and you give the skin the right conditions, a lot of the waste can come out via the skin, which makes it easier for the kidneys. You might not have a steam sauna like we do. But if you exercise, you can stimulate perspiration and almost mimic, almost, the steam sauna. That's the waste comes out. Now, I usually have a steam when I'm at Misty Mountain with our guests once or twice a week. And because I'm in there a couple of times a week, I do not wear my swimming costume. What are swimming costumes made out of? Nylon. Nylon. <laughs> so I just have some little cotton shorts and a little cotton crop top, which, you know, that's the best thing to swim in because in the steam sauna, my pores are open and I don't want to be absorbing the <laughs> chemicals. Plus, I remember when I first started to do steams, I noticed that my poor swimming costumes, after a while, they're looking pretty sad because <laughs> they're getting so hot and they're starting to, to shrink up. So remember that if you have a steam sauna, wear, get some little cotton shorts and cotton crop tops. Um, that's the best thing to use. Your skin also, not only does it throw off waste, not only does it absorb, that's why if there's a, there's a mouldy orange in your fruit bowl, don't pick it up because you'll get it, the skin will absorb it. Get some tongs and also cover your, <laughs> cover your face. It's toxic stuff. Your skin, your skin also breathes. And, and that's why when they did the movie Goldfinger, the James Bond movie, they painted the, the model gold from the front and then filmed her, took that off, then, then did the back and filmed the back because they knew that if they cover the whole body, that person will die because your skin breathes. Now, my son was watching this show, Mythbusters. It's an American show, yeah, and they bust myths. And they were going to bust the myth that you can't cover your whole body. So I was walking past and I thought, hmm, let's have a look at this. Anyway, the, the guy that was doing it, he um, painted, his, painted all his legs. He had someone there helping and he got up here and he got up here. And as he got up almost level with his armpits, he, he, went, he went into a crisis. And the, the cameramen, the producers were running in just to save his life and pulling that 
pulling that off him. Well, that wasn't a myth and they didn't bust that one because it is true. <laughs> that you can't cover the whole body. So be careful what you put on it. So if you, if you do have dry skin, and I certainly acknowledge that people who, some people have inherited dry skins. I haven't inherited a dry skin and I know that that, <laughs> that means I don't have to put anything on it. But I also, again, eat oils on the inside that some people find they need to put something on their skin. Now there's one place I stay where I need something and that is Colorado. Wow, that's the only place where my hair stands out like this <laughs> and my, my hands get dry because it's very dry there, it's very dry there. But be very careful what you put on your skin. So go for your, your coconut oil based moisturizers, things like that. So I do acknowledge some people have dry skin and might, might, need, might need a little bit extra. Something that also keeps the skin supple is being well hydrated. So um, make sure you're well hydrated, make sure that you're having that little bit of salt to account for the loss in your perspiration. Dr. Um, Robert Thompson, who wrote the book, The Calcium Lie, he says, a little crystal of Celtic salt in your mouth before every glass of water just replaces the minerals you lost yesterday. So we're losing them in our urine, from our colon, every, all body waste comes out, it is salt, salt water. A salt-free diet is a dangerous diet, it's a ridiculous diet, and I, I ask you, what's lentil stew without salt? <laughs> you wouldn't even want to eat it, would you? And what's avocado and tomato on a lovely sourdough bread without salt? And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth. It's old English. If the salt has lost its savour. So what's savour? I'd like to suggest that the table salt has lost its savour because there's only two minerals in it. Sea water has 92 minerals. So the Bible says if the salt has lost its savour, it's now good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. And I thought of that when I was in Wisconsin in the winter time and saw them throwing the salt on the ground to, to melt the ice. From the time, we understand. <laughs> yeah. And that table salt is a dangerous salt. Did you know that if you were to mix a teaspoon of it with a cup of water to make up several quarts, and put it in a fish tank and put the fish from the sea in that salt water, they all die. It's actually a poison, that table salt. But what about iodized salt? Well, instead of having two minerals, we've now got three. And did you know within a few hours of opening that iodized salt, all the iodine evaporates? But if you crunch on that Celtic salt, you're getting parts per million micro amounts, but that's all our body needs. And if you're having that eight times a day, and also on your potato, and also on your avocado and tomato, um, you're, you're replacing exactly what you need. You know, our palate tells us it's not nice if it's too salty, and it's not nice if there's no salt. There's, there's a balance there. One lady said, Barbara, we're finding your food so salty. I said, yeah, that's because you've trained yourself out of salt. Well, I've got some good news. You can train yourself back into salt. But it needs to be the whole salt. There's salt and there's salt. Was that old ad on television? There's oils and there's oils. Well, there is oils and there's oils. So Himalayan salt is not quite as good. And you'll see it's more free flowing, which means it hasn't got as many magnesiums. It's got about 75 minerals, but it's, it's not the quality of the Celtic, but it's certainly better than the... That's right, it's better than the table salt. That's right. And so until they can, can keep up their production to, to um, meet the demand of the Celtic salt, you certainly have a bit of Himalayan. So your skin needs water, it needs the, the right salt, it needs exercise, to, um, and it needs to breathe. So please be careful of what you're putting on your skin. Another organ of elimination, we're looking at eliminating the waste, that's not right, is your lungs. 
and your lungs need fresh air. It was such a delight to me last night to be able to sleep and have the windows open. I was, I was doing meetings in Marietta near Atlanta a few weeks ago and I was in a hotel and they had the air conditioning at 78, no, 68, 68. And outside it's 100 degrees. It's not good for the body to go from that high. So I made my room 78 <laughs> and I tried to open the windows, it was pretty hard, I wish I had my strong sons there. I could open it this much. There are locks there so you can't open. We need fresh air. So I thought I'd go for my morning walk, very hard to find a tree, <laughs> very hard to find a park. So it's just lovely to be living out here where we've got the beautiful trees. Our lungs need fresh air. And one of the ways our lungs get fresh air is there is one part of the body and there's only one part that purifies the air, that humidifies the air, that warms the air, that balances the blood gases and that pressurises the air. Any guesses? <laughs> it's nose and nose only. In Genesis 2.7, the Bible says that God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. Got that one? nostrils the bread of life, the breath of life. I sometimes wonder if God breathed into man's nostrils with his nostril <laughs> because it's the nostrils that do all that. So breathing in through the nostrils and breathing out through the nostrils because if you breathe out through your mouth you lose too much carbon dioxide. And notice I said that the nose balances blood gases. The blood gases are oxygen and carbon dioxide. So in our lungs, when we breathe in air, there's a gaseous exchange between the alveoli and the blood. And we've got 25 trillion red blood cells and those blood cells have 270 million haemoglobin. You've heard of haemoglobin? The haemoglobin carries the oxygen and it has each one has four docking sites and if it comes to our alveoli the blood comes in and there are four molecules of carbon dioxide it can pick up four molecules of oxygen but if we're breathing out through our mouth and we're losing too much carbon dioxide then when the blood comes to the to the alveoli and there's only two molecules of carbon dioxide only two molecules of oxygen can be picked up and remember this morning we looked at how oxygen will give you 18 times more energy in the cell. That's where we need it, in the cell. And then, you come, then the blood comes to the cell and there's another gaseous exchange, the carbon dioxide coming out of the cell and the oxygen coming out of the blood. But if there's only two molecules of carbon dioxide, then it can only pick up two molecules of oxygen. So there's that gaseous exchange in two places. And if you breathe out through your mouth, you lose too much carbon dioxide. That's why breathing in and out through the nose balances blood gases. And those blood gases need the balance. So we need to go in and out through nose. The hardest time is when you're exercising. So when I was walking up to Emerald Lake in the Rocky Mountain National Park. When I said two, I was thinking of two kilometres, but it was two miles. It was twice as far. <laughs> and you're like this the whole time. You're going up, up, up. The hardest time is when you're like that. But you can. You can. You can. Go low, slow and deep. I call it God's LSD. Long, slow, deep. in and out through the nose, balances the blood gases. And you know what you'll find, and I found this, as I'm going, I had these two young guys, one was 20, one was 25, they were ahead of me, they kept looking around, they kept looking around, yeah, I was still there, I was still there. I'm the tortoise. 
slow and steady, breathing through my mouth. And when they looked around, I was going, and they're going, yeah, yeah, we're, we're doing it. We're breathing in and out through the, na- the nose. Now, if you're used to breathing with a bit of mouth, tomorrow morning when you do your exercise, it will be a challenge. And if it's a real challenge, you're allowed to have a little bit from the mouth now and then. But you will be able to train yourself as I have, even on that going up 12,000 feet, to breathe in and out only through your nose. You will get more oxygen at the cellular level and that's where we need the energy. Practice makes perfect, you'll get better at it, breathing in and out through the nose. On the morning exercise, I always have a couple of tissues because if you need to blow your nose, please do, then, then it's easier to breathe out through your nose, in and out. The lungs also need you to be drinking adequate water because there's a droplet of water in every alveoli. We have 300 million alveoli, praise God for that, because every time a cigarette is smoked or passive smoke is breathed in, an alveoli is destroyed. So we have a lot of alveoli and they, when we're well hydrated there's a little droplet of water in every one and because of the surface tension of water, you know the surface tension? You've seen the little creatures, those little insects that walk on water? They can do that because of the surface tension of water. If you squirt some shampoo in there they'll all sink because it breaks the surface tension of water. Because of the surface tension of water in those little alveoli sacs, when I breathe out it causes a collapsing of my alveolo, which means I'm able to breathe out all those waste gases so that when I breathe in, I can get a full quota of oxygen. So water is essential. Exercise. When we exercise, our breathing gets deeper. And remember, God's LSD, low, slow and deep. Did you know what the low, slow, deep does? It stimulates your, your parasympathetic nervous system. That's your peaceful, calming nervous system. So if ever you're feeling a little stressed, you've been a little bit challenged, you know the best thing to do? 5.5 seconds in, hold for three. 5.5 seconds out, long, slow, deep. That's your calming nervous system. How many people that are in a, having a panic attack are going, <laughs> you know what that does? Stimulates your sympathetic nervous system. That's your fight and your flight. Yeah. So if ever I come across someone, and often I'm called, if I'm in a conference, Barbara, <clears throat> you know, the first thing I do is, and I have to say it very nicely, please close your mouth. <laughs> you don't say, shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Please close your mouth, breathe through your nose. And when I tell them about God's LSD, there's a little bit of a smile. <laughs> and you'll, you'll see them calm down because that stimulates your para, parasympathetic nervous system, peaceful nervous system. The other organ of elimination is your kidneys. And your kidneys do a wonderful job at filtering your blood. But they have certain needs. The kidneys need you to drink adequate water. Your, your urine should be the colour of water. Got that? When your kidneys are the colour of water, it makes it so much easier for, I mean, when your urine's the colour of water, it makes it so much easier for your kidneys to filter. Because the, the thicker the waste, the more the filter gets blocked up, is that right? But when your water that you're drinking is around eight glasses a day, you'll find that your urine, the colour will be a lot lighter, indicating that you're being very kind to your kidneys. The kidneys also need you to exercise. When you exercise, you increase the blood supply to the kidneys. When you exercise, every step that you're taking. The kidneys are being strengthened and toned to perform their work. The kidneys also need you to keep them warm. In Australia, we live with the elements. If it's hot, we put the fan on and we just dress lightly. If it's cold, we put a jumper, called a woolly jumper on 
own boots, still a bit cold, we light the fire. So we live with the elements. And I see out here in the country, you're, you more do that. Do you know, often I find in America, it's hot outside, but I have to wear warm clothes, it's so cold. And I also find that when you've got a, a, a society that are carrying excess weight, they feel the heat. But as you'll see tomorrow morning when I look at hormones, it can be a hormonal imbalance as well. And a hormonal imbalance, if that estrogen's high, it's very difficult to lose weight. So it sort of gets in this vicious cycle. So I do understand, especially when I was in Roanoke, Alabama, oh, those people are big. They're, 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 they're big's big. Now in Australia, 63% of Australians are either obese or overweight. Apparently we've overtaken them, Mary, but I have to say you're bigger, a bit bigger than our big, I think, <laughs> especially in this little town. And what do they eat a lot of? Here it is. Here it is. Have you seen people go on low-fat, no-fat diets to lose weight? And do they lose weight? No, they don't. In fact, after three days, they're so hungry, they just go and eat anything they see because it's fat that gives the feeling of satiation. What's satiation? That's satisfaction that you, you don't need to eat all day long because you're comfortably satisfied. So even in a hot climate, when people are in air-conditioned rooms, rooms, those kidneys can get a chill. So the kidneys are basically behind our waist. We need to keep the kidneys warm. When you keep the kidneys warm, it allows blood supply to freely go in and out. When the kidneys are cold, in fact, any area of the body that's cold, it's an indication there's not a lot of blood going to that area. Remember what the blood is? It's the life of the flesh. And perfect health requires perfect circulation, meaning my whole body is about the same temperature. So the kidneys need water, they need exercise, they need for you to keep them warm. And they also need for you to sleep at night. Because that's when the body recharges and revives, is in the night hours. And we'll be looking at that in another lecture. Colon. We'll be looking at that, at this one, in a little bit more detail tonight when we go on our journey through our gastrointestinal tract. Have you noticed that the colon has a mind of its own? If you're going too much and you tell it to stop, it won't. And if, and if, it's, if you're constipation and you tell it to go, it won't. It has a mind of its own. And I, I've got a book that I'm wading through at the moment, taking me a while to get through. It's fairly heavy. It's called The Second Brain. And it's talking about the colon. You know how people talk about that gut feeling? It's, Interesting how much the brain and the colon have to do with each other. And I know when I was um, being taught colonic irrigations about 30 years ago by a 90-year-old woman, she said, tight mind, tight colon. <laughs> That's why a lady said to me, I can't stand it. My husband goes to the toilet with a book. I said, you've got to go to the toilet with a book. <laughs> Relax. <laughs> Relax. So the colon does... You know, here we are, laughter. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones, says Proverbs 17.22. Well, I put another word in there. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the colon. Relax. What the colon also needs, it also needs stimulation. Because it has a mind of its own, it needs stimulation. And laughter stimulates the colon. Fibre stimulates the colon. What you will notice is it's only microscopic waste that can, can come out of the skin, the lungs and the kidneys. The largest pieces of waste are eliminated via the colon. What fibre does is it stimulates movement through the colon which is called peristalsis. And what fibre also does is it sweeps the colon. There are lots of little grooves. I'm going to draw a gastrointestinal tract this evening. And as we go through the gastrointestinal tract, you'll see the different body parts. But what you'll see is the colon has lots of little folds, has lots of little corners, 
and it needs to be swept every day. And your highest fibre foods are your fruits and your vegetables. And there's a little seed that's becoming very popular called chia seed. And the chia seed can take up to 25% of its own weight in fluid. And so mixing chia with water, best thing is to put it, you, you only put about an eighth in a jar and then fill it with water and shake, 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 shake. And within about five minutes, you'll see that it started to form a soft gel. And you just pour that all over your breakfast in the morning. In fact, a half a cup of that a day, I can assure you that will, that will stimulate peristalsis in a gentle way, because it goes like a soft jelly. Um, and that's very good for the colon. That's a real easy uh, laxative. The colon also needs water. One of the main functions of the colon is to take water out so stools are formed. So if you're dehydrated, more water comes out than should be coming out. And then we've got rabbit pellets and cement. <laughs> Exercise. The colon needs to be moving every day. Take time every day to exercise. When you exercise, you increase blood supply to the colon, and when you exercise, the colon is moving, especially the core strengthening exercises. <coughs> and we should all be doing core strengthening exercises. It's one of the best things you can do for your back. How many people have back problems? And have you noticed that the biggest bone in the whole body is your femur? And the biggest muscle mass in the whole body is your quads. And God designed it that way because that's how we should bend and lift. If you bend your back like that, all the weight is taken there. But if you keep that back straight and lift and bend with your, your, your thighs, that's up to the weight. Have you noticed how a baby or a little 18 month picks up a ball? They go like this. They don't go like that. So make sure, ladies, if you wear a skirt, make sure it's flary so that you can squat. <laughs> <laughs> but also be mindful of how you bend so that all the bend happens like that. I've trained myself, I can keep my back straight fairly fairly way down now but I was watching when I was in the Bronx a few years ago this Jamaican man was weeding his legs were straight and his back was perfectly straight as he was weeding the garden wow I'm in the airport a lot so many people when they bend it's like that eee. that puts a lot of strain on the back so you've got to be mindful of how you move all your core muscles are connected to your spine so when you strengthen your core muscles, you automatically strengthen your spine. So be mindful of exercise, the different parts that you exercise, strengthen that core, Pilates or core strengthening type exercise, push-ups, push-ups every day, everyone get that? Push-ups, can't do push-ups, do them on the wall, do them on your knees, but to strengthen, to strengthen upper body. One more thing with colon, and we'll explore this in more detail tonight, is position. I was in Africa in late April, and I went to the bathroom, and it's a hole in the floor. <laughs> it's all tiled, and it's all flush. I saw the same thing in Singapore, I saw the same thing in India, I've seen the same thing in many countries. Traditionally, people always squatted to do their daily evacuation. Science now shows that when you squat, you release a muscle in the last part of the colon that opens the colon up. I will illustrate tonight. So position's important. You can go to Bed Bath & Beyond and buy a squatty potty, which sits around your toilet, which allows you, when you put your feet on that, you mimic the squatting position. So it's actually e easy. <laughs> Nearly anyone can do that. And that takes all pressure off the anus, which prevents and can help to heal hemorrhoids. We'll look at that a bit more tonight. So there's one more organ 
and I'll take this away so that I can explain one more organ of elimination and this one might surprise you and it might not, it's only a tiny little organ and it's the tongue. And often when our guests are fasting, they wake up in the morning and the tongue doesn't feel very nice. <laughs> in one, one man said to me, I feel like the hen house floor. <laughs> the tongue feels pretty bad. That's because the tongue does release, the tongue does release waste. And there's a very simple thing that you can do, it's called oil pulling. An oil pulling is putting a teaspoon of coconut oil in your mouth and swishing it. And you swish it around for about 10 minutes and then release it out, not down, we call it the plug hole, I think you call it the sink hole. Because when coconut oil goes, gets cold, what does it do? Yes. Solid. <laughs> so you want to release it out on the grass, give a bit of food to the microbes living in the grass and rinse your mouth out a few times. It's called oil pulling because it pulls waste out of your tongue, it pulls waste out of the glands under your tongue, it pulls waste out of the blood vessels under your tongue. That's why it's called oil pulling. And I've known people that have had chest problems and they said, once I've oil pulled, I usually cough up a lump or two. It seems to loosen way down there. And I've had people with sinus problems and they say, after I've oil pulled, I blow. It seems to release things from there. And you've got a tiny little organ in the throat here called the tonsils. God didn't make a mistake when he put the tonsils there. They're the watchmen at the gate. And they're the only part of the lymphatic system that dumps straight out. So don't be surprised when you oil pull that you'll cough up not necessarily from your lungs, but even out of your tonsils. Your tonsils are the watchmen at the gate. And if there's a problem, well, the, the, uh, the watchmen, they blow, blow that trumpet pretty hard, don't they? So if there's a problem in the body, they'll swell. So there's your tonsillitis. And if the watchman keeps yelling on the walls of the city, and you get annoyed at his blowing that trumpet all the time, you just shoot him, okay? And then you've got no more of that terrible noise. Same with, them. Wait, same with the tonsils. Well, you just cut them out. That makes no sense at all. You've just lost the watchman at the gate. There is a reason those tonsils are there, yes? What if you have metal mouth off at one point? Did you not know it was mercury guns? What if you've got metal in the mouth? You absolutely do it, because when you pull, you're releasing it straight out. So it's perfectly fine. I've known people that have had bleeding gums, infected gums, gingivitis, and they all pull three times a day and within a week the, the gums are all getting strong, the, there's no more bleeding, there's no more bad gums. So it's a very simple thing that you can do, it only takes 10 minutes. When our guests are on a detox program, the two days of juices, we encourage them to oil pull three times a day. We know when people are oil pulling because they start using sign language. <laughs> it's a very simple thing to do. It's a great way to do a very simple, simple detox. So as you can see by what I've shown you, that it, it not only can help to pull the waste out in a small way. So I'll give you one story to illustrate. My son-in-law, Matthew, he's a builder and he was lacquering a floor. And it was a fairly toxic lacquer and he had all the windows shut because it was a dirt road outside and he didn't want the dust to come in on his new lacquer. When he got home that night, he felt so ill from the chemicals. He felt so ill, he thought, what am I going to do? I'll oil pull. So he put the coconut oil in his mouth and within one minute it just tasted like chemicals. So he released it out and then he did it again. And then he did it again. He did it about 10 times over the hour. And he said, and every time he did it, it took a bit longer before he could taste the chemicals. So after one hour, he oil pulled for 10 minutes before he started to get a trace of the chemical taste, release that out. And by the end of him doing that little <laughs> intensive detox with oil pulling, he no longer felt ill. And I'd like to suggest that that oil pulling had pulled most of those chemicals out. So that's an impressive story. He only did it because he just felt so ill and he thought, 
I'll try, I'll try this one. So an illustration of how it can pull chemicals and waste out of your body and such a simple thing to do. I ran out... Uh, any coconut oil will do. I ran out of coconut oil once and so I did it with um, olive oil. Oh, I didn't like it as much. <laughs> I much preferred the coconut and yet to put on my lentil stew I much rather the taste of olive oil. But I must say that have you googled vegan frozen desserts and vegan frozen cheesecakes? Most of them are based on coconut oil and they are amazing. They are delicious. I said, certainly don't mind eating coconut oil like that. Are there any questions before we close? When you use the one? Yep, yep. It, it can help the teeth, can help the gums, it helps the whole oral, oral area. That's true. It's antibacterial and it also nourishes, yeah? When am I going to look at childhood nutrition? On Wednesday morning. So Wednesday morning at 10? Yeah. Yes? The chai seeds of the water. You say it's part of your breakfast. I mean... Well, what you can do with the chia and water, if you prefer, you can do chia in uh, coconut water, you could do chia in apple juice, you could do chia, you know, however you want, if you wanted some flavour, and you could just drink it, yeah. Yes? Yeah. Well, there are some metal chelators that you can take. And a metal chelator, as the name implies, it chelates with metal to help it get out of the body. And chlorella, and I know this is an algae, but you can buy organic chlorella. You can buy it in a powder or a tablet form, and it chelates metal. And also cilantro. And you can buy that as a tincture or you can put it on everything you eat. And it's more a winter vegetable. It goes to seed a little bit in the summer. And I know you're nearing the end of your summer months, aren't you? So it's a good time to put your cilantro seeds in. And also, you're, you're good, good fats because what your fats, your, your fats do is they protect. They protect your cell against the damage of, of metals. See, if someone's got mercury fillings in their mouth, they're on cholesterol lowering medication, and they're on a fat-free diet, that's a recipe for disaster. Because you've not only lost your protection, which the, the fat does to the nerve cells, because our cells are 50% fat. The membrane, except for our nerve cell, that's 70% fat. The, the brain's the fattiest organ in the body. So, very important to have good fats in your diet as a protection. Thanks. Yes? You had mentioned in the first part of the day uh, about getting resources from the sea and, and that they're not always good because of all the trash. Yeah. Um, what do you think about sea moss? You would have to ensure, as I said with the chlorella, that they say organic. It's from a a fairly pristine part of the sea. I'm sure there may be still a few that, are, that, aren't, that don't have the chemicals. Yes? What would you suggest for GERD? For? For GERD. GERD. Well, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to go on our journey through our gastrointestinal tract, and I'll be exploring that in detail then. Are you able to come tonight? Oh, unfortunately not. So I'll give you some quick ones. So it's magnesium that closes that muscle. And that muscle at the top of the stomach is called the cardiac sphincter. Sphincter being it's a muscle. 
and when, when it tightens, it opens. So when we take food in and our esophagus is, is you know, peristalting with our swallow, then the muscles tighten and the cardiac sphincter opens and the food goes in. So if a person's stressed and the muscles are tightening, that can open it. And eating the largest meal at the end of the day and then going to bed, that pushes, gravity pushes against that cardiac muscle. That's not the odd day you might eat late, but day after day, after week after week, after month after month of having the largest meal at the end of the day, then lying down, eventually that weakens that muscle. So having most of your food at breakfast and lunch, having magnesium. So with our guests with severe reflux or GERDs, we'll give them 500 million milligrams of calcium citrate four times a day. One lady said, that's ridiculous, that would cause diarrhea. Well, we have not found that. And if it does cause you to have diarrhea, back off and just have it before you go to bed. So we have found that those simple things can resolve GERD or reflux. Sorry, magnesium citrate, yeah. That's right, magnesium is your ultimate muscle relaxant, so it relaxes that muscle, and when it's relaxed, it closes. Well, Celtic sea salt, so it's better to take it on the tongue versus putting it in water. That's right, I just, I just want to understand that's right, that. that's right. Okay. Because what happens is the membrane around the cell is like this, it's a bilayed membrane, and when you put the uh, Celtic salt in your mouth and crunch on it, it releases three magnesiums. They're taken to the cell wall, and then you drink your water, it pulls the water inside the cell. And when you crunch those crystals, just picture that it's releasing those um, mineral gases straight into your body. It's the best way to do it. Okay, time for oh, a couple of questions up there, yeah? Hi, you were talking about skin and how we should be careful. What do you feel about sunscreen? Like, people talk about how the sun can damage the skin, but then we need to put on sunscreen. How do you feel about that? Well, I never wear sunscreens ever, but because I have what's called milky skin, I have to be careful. So if I go to the beach or lie by the pool, I have my watch. 15 minutes front, 15 minutes back, then under the umbrella. Because I know if I do more than that, I will burn. And, you know, when people are going to go lie out in the sun for hours, they're going to burn. <laughs> so they put sunscreens on. Well, the Great Barrier Reef, you've heard of the Great, Great Barrier Reef in Australia. You have to go five kilometres out now to see it. And part of it is because of the sunscreens. All Australians have been brainwashed that they have to wear this sunscreen. So if you're going to be out in the sun for a long period, wear a shirt, wear a big hat. <laughs> You've got to protect that sun. But if you have dark skin, you can have 10 times the sun that I can have. <laughs> so the darker the skin, the more you need. But it's a pity that people have gone from too much sun to no sun, and now we've got vitamin D deficiency popping up everywhere. And they have discovered that vitamin D deficiency is a contributing factor to skin cancer. People aren't getting enough sun. <laughs> so it's a balance. Yes? I have two questions. One, um, in reference to this morning meeting, uh, what are the good grains, uh, like quinoa, is that okay? What are the good grains? The good grains are mostly your gluten-free grains, and that is millet, millet and sorghum. They're the two lectin-free gra grains, and lectin is a plant component that can increase inflammation. Uh, so millet, sorghum, buckwheat, quinoa, there's lots of different grains. And one more question if that's okay. Um, the, in reference to the green drinks that you were talking about this morning, what does that consist of for you? Okay, well in my book I call it the great green drink and because we live out in the bush we, we get um, all your edible plants like uh, dandelion, um, Plantain, I think you have plantain growing everywhere here. Um, pumpkin tops, did I say that one already? So there's a whole lot of edible greens. 
I usually go along and chew on a bit, and if it's too bitter, we won't, we won't use that. And if I do use dandelion, and you notice I'm still alive, so the only one I will not try is oleander. You know, that flowery bush, that's definitely toxic. But the fact is there aren't many toxic ones. But we always put a lot of mint in it so that it tastes all right. So we blend wild greens with water, probably four cups of wild greens to four cups of water. I mean, you could even use the outside lead of lettuce, the, the kale, the, the spinach leaves, and then we strain it. And then we keep it in little bottles in the fridge and the guests will drink that green water. It's like drinking grass, but <laughs> you're getting your chlorophyll. Yes? Do we soak our nuts overnight? No, we don't, because I think they're so much more flavoursome if you don't soak them. But don't they have, a, don't they have a, a toxic chemical in them? Well, only if you eat a bucket a day. And it is true, they are a little easier to digest if they've been soaked and then dehydrated. So I leave it up to the person, but personally, I just love the, the strong flavour of the almond. And ideally, you have organic almonds that are raw and fresh, so it's again just picking and choosing what you eat. So let's have a break and I look forward to seeing you at six o'clock. So tomorrow morning, so tonight we go on our journey through the gut, tomorrow morning we, we look at child nutrition and if you were a child you need to hear this.